let me introduce Guy, who will start with um, eye tracking in babies. This is something I've got to see. <laughs> Well, uh, nice to see you all today. And actually, I'm going to start with a caveat that there will be no baby eye tracking today. Maybe steps in that direction are being made. Um, I'm re really here, very excited to report on the hard work by one particular person, Alex uh, Fraser, who actually can't be here to present today. So all of the hard work is his. Uh, and um, I'll take you through the journey of what we've learned so far um, with help from Gorilla, Nick and Joe in particular along the way. So I don't think, uh, as you're an audience of uh, psychologists, I don't think I need to convince you that people are very important in our environment. Um, and that's been shown with many classic eye tracking studies, even low tech studies that show that people in natural scenes attract our attention. And um, that's the case also for particular elements of, of faces, eyes uh, attract attention very clearly. And again, eye tracking has really helped us um, see that. Um, now, um, now, um, a very, really important point to also keep in mind is that eyes um, direct our attention in really interesting ways that can that have been measured by many psychologists. And now I'll, I'll, I'll um, start off by then explaining where I come from and my team, where we come from in terms of understanding face processing and gaze processing. We are broadly really interested in understanding what happens if face processing and eye contact are atypical. Um, and that's because we study and try and understand um, how processing of the natural environment operates sometimes differently in people who, are, uh, who process that environment differently. In particular, we focus on young children whose uh, verbal skills, um, ability to follow complex instructions might be really um, compromised or limited. Um, and therefore, it's really important um, to use methods that like measure, measuring eye tracking to gauge attention in different ways. We're also very interested in, in studying participants who are maybe very anxious about highly unfamiliar environments like labs. And so um, that is possibly the perfect storm to create a situation where lab-based testing is not the ideal way of seeing uh, these participants. So we've, we've found ways, really creative ways of working around that problem of doing eye tracking in the home, eye tracking at school, uh, in more familiar environments. But that normally involves using infrared eye trackers that are becoming increasingly portable, but actually are still pretty expensive, piece, expensive pieces of kit that have to be taken um, to um, the location where we want to be doing some testing. Well, if you're interested in looking at uh, some of the data that we've collected that way, and uh, Brianna's work and Jackie's work and Elise's work uh, here has really been pioneering, at least in, in understanding uh, how we can get creative about eye tracking outside of the lab. But uh, here enter Alex, and who for many different reasons came on board in my team at a time where we could just not do lab-based testing. Our building, I don't know if you know, uh, in 2017 was closed down uh, very suddenly because of asbestos management. So there was no lab to be used. And there, uh, therefore, we couldn't bring in participants like this one. This is my daughter, by the way, who's at school today for the first day uh, in three months. So you know, I had to put a picture of, of her in here. Um, here you can see her in a you know, pretty iodine, uh, really clean, uh, quiet environment in the lab doing calibration with our infrared TX300. Um, and then she's moving on to, be making, uh, to working on a task that uses a mouse for responses. Now, well, that, as I said, is very much out of reach. At least some of the participants were really interested in testing who, can, who find the lab environment aversive uh, or negative and therefore impacting on their ability to show what they know and what they can do. Those limits the sample size and the representativeness of the data we collect. So in collaboration with uh, Cauldron and Gorilla, then Alex really started to try and develop online eye tracking tools that would allow us to reach participants who don't travel to the lab to increase the representativeness of our data. But we definitely decided that we were going to play safe and start not with babies, start in fact with adults. Um, so all of this was a collaboration with Gorilla with the aim of developing browser-based remote eye tracking capabilities that could reach um, autistic adults and kids, um, starting in fact with neurotypical adults. Um, now, we didn't have to start all this because in fact, there's been, this has been a very active area of research and much of that is 
in open source software that's available. This is just one example, Web, WebGazer is a JavaScript tool that is, is a great um, documentation. If you're interested in it, please have a look at it. Um, that really pioneered um, web-based web -based, um, eye tracking uh, using browsers. And so, um, and not only has it been used quite heavily, but it's also been evaluated and written about. So again, here's a reference, not, not one of ours at all, for those who are interested in following how WebGazer has been used. But the key point is that all of this work was uh, done primarily in adults who are well-behaving adults, um, and we wanted to move that forward, uh, further and test and the feasibility of this way of testing outside that realm of um, safe adult participants. Um, so with, uh, with Joe and with Nick and, and their team, we worked on um, building on WebGazer so that now a beta, um, a beta um, area in Gorilla um, is, is the eye tracking zone. And what I'm showing here is simply the first step of a sample experiment that um, we developed with them. Um, that has an eye tracking calibration. Um, it's a nine point calibration, it's implemented in three minutes, so that's pretty good, uh, at least in adults. And, and the three minutes include both the calibration and the validation steps. So that's, it's really quick, um, very simple calibration here. I'm just presenting what, what happens. The, dot, the dots appear on screen and as usual, you're required to, to look at them as in any eye tracking experiment. Of course, those dots could be made more fun for younger children, but we wanted to test what those data would look like uh, given a nine point calibration. And then because this is working with Gorilla, if you're familiar with these kinds of screens, we can integrate that calibration with your standard trial setup. And, and it's really user friendly as Gorilla always is in that you have a, a timeline and stimuli that are presented where you want them and when you want them. And in this case, we had three regions of interest that we were interested in mapping. A central region of interest, you'll see in a moment what we presented there, and two lateral regions of interest. So we started really simply uh, with three areas, of course. It, we would really like to move to testing um, vertical uh, discrimination, so upper quadrant and lower quadrant, left and right. But we thought, again, the baby steps, we should start easy and simple. And we did, in fact, start with a very simple face processing task um, rather than using naturalistic scenes, which is just what eventually we would really like to do. Um, so centrally presented face, it then disappears. Here is uh, not the real experiment to just be creating it for today. Then the, the face appears, it's uh, oriented in, in one particular, uh, the gaze are oriented in one particular direction of space, and at that location, an object that needs to be classified um, by participants is presented, either as uh, kitchen utensils or uh, garden tools. In a very simple gaze queuing task. We know uh, Alex and in fact many other uh, researchers, but Alex is using Gorilla um, studied the, beha this, the behavioral benefits of these gaze queuing effects uh, in hundreds of participants, thanks, thanks to Gorilla, but also in many participants in the lab. So we know that effect really, really well. We'd already gone through the pipeline that many um, of the previous researchers that advocated of pre registering our hypothesis for the behavioral data um, and then going on to test them. There's a, a whole other different story that I'll tell you about if you wanted to about the pre-registration that this was such a positive experience. But again, I don't want to repeat the excellent lessons of this morning. What we did do also, uh, in addition to collect behavioral data that replicate, was also collect the eye tracking data. And we're really at the initial steps of that process. And I'll explain that why that is in a moment in the, on the next slide. But I just wanted to give you the positives. First positive is, even with a pretty straightforward laptop, not a fancy webcam, but building on WebGazer and the interaction with Gorilla, we could collect pretty good heat maps and X and Y coordinates um, of the point of gaze location. Uh, what's not recorded, I forgot to say, what's not recorded is a video of participants, which has, has really good positives and negatives. The positives are that the data protection issues that go with collecting video data are not there. The negatives are we only have X and Y coordinates of the landing position of eyes. So it's actually quite hard at present to validate um, those locations. But for now, at least with these very simple stimuli, stimuli the heat maps and the landing positions are, are where we would expect them to be. So that's great. Using Gorilla Code, in fact, it's easy to process those data. There are many remaining challenges, and Alex is really working thinking and thinking about these uh, very hard for the future. 
So other adult browser-based data so far collects really well. That's great. Uh, but in um, what Gorilla does uh, produce um, through, in terms of data is a series of X and Y coordinates. Um, and we were quite certain that some of those were off. It was an, an interesting, infrequent occurrence, but um, there are data quality issues that definitely need to be ironed out. Of course, actually, in fact, as soon as we said that and we explained that to Nick and Joe, off they went and explored and tried to understand why that might be the case. But then uh, definitely those interesting cases of deviations made us think that at least at the beginning when first developing our paradigms, we would want to collect some validation data. Um, and in fact, that was our plan anyway, was to actually run our experiments on a browser, but in the lab to test them against gold standard eye tracking tools like um, uh, our, our normal eye trackers. And at the same time, collect video data from participants to also know whether there was something wrong um, with the recordings. But then COVID-19 struck, so actually we now can't do this, in this step of validation. And so the added difficulty that has now uh, come to the fore is that collecting validation videos is difficult. Again, enter Cauldron and Nick and Joe uh, to the rescue, who in fact have enabled another beta, uh, beta feature in Gorilla, uh, which is the video zone. And this is Alex, in fact, using it to collect the video data of himself doing the calibration. And we've not yet integrated the two. Um, so the eye tracking uh, data and the validation data, and you have to think very carefully about that, how that would use in a participant's home when there's a single webcam. In the lab, very easy, multiple cameras, easy to do that, but much harder at, at people's home. So that remains a challenge, but we'll, we'll keep plug plugging at it. The downside of collecting validation videos is that then we have data protection issues because um, this information is personal data. So we have to convince, of course, consent people uh, participants making it very clear what we're going to be doing with those data. Not only that, there are other difficulties and challenges that we're really interested in, uh, in understanding better. Um, for example, using those same techniques, but in participants, for participants whose internet connection is not always good. For other, for my sins, many sins, I've started to work with, uh, with colleagues who work in non-Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic countries and lower middle income countries. And there the internet connections are pretty poor. So actually we wouldn't be able to use browser-based uh, collection methods. And for that reason, we're actually thinking of complementing the great work with Gorilla with downloadable apps that instead might suit uh, participants who can download temporarily onto their machine or onto a machine and collect the data locally. So we're still a long way from testing babies. We're still ironing out many, many challenges with adults first. And a lot of work has inspired the rationale for doing this eye tracking work outside the lab and the steps that have followed. But I really must thank Alex and Joe and Nick at Gorilla for all their help along the way. And that's me, done. You're going to, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, that, that is really, really remarkable. Um, thank you. Thank well, you. I'm going to move, move the screen so I don't stare in the distance and actually look at you, Joe, as you speak. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was thinking about that as you were talking about the eye tracking in the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. It's always a risk that the, the image is actually not by the camera and it looks like I'm looking elsewhere and I think, oh yeah. man, it's hard yeah. not to look at someone's face though. Um, yeah. I mean, that is just extraordinary. I, and, you know, forgive me for pushing, I suppose, but it just raises the question, how far are you away from doing things like you know, facial recognition, facial coding, heart rate mm -hmm. from, you know, changes in skin color, all of those seem to be potentially available if you have access to that webcam. Are they things mm -hmm. of interest? They're, well, one, they're, they, of course they're of interest. We're scientists, right? So we would do anything to do interesting data, <laughs> some interesting data collection. But I know, and I'm joking there, of course, because they have to, any of this face data collection needs to be really thought very carefully from an ethical point of view, precisely because of the data protection issues. There are lots of really interesting algorithms that are out there that we've been exploring, in fact, with our colleagues in research software engineering that make even uh, gathering uh, eye position data more accurate by, for example, using the nose, using the eyebrow. And um, we haven't gone into looking at uh, color, skin coloration or changes in lipstick about anything like that. I would be super interested in getting better information on pupil uh, size. I don't think we are going to, I mean, let's face it, for now we're doing three regions of interest and we're just happy with that. <laughs> but the level of resolution that's required for anything finer than that 
I don't know, I'm, I'm a skeptic as for now, but I'd love to hear from um, with software engineers who are maybe interested in taking those challenges on. Uh, it's been really interesting because I, I love eye tracking and I continue to defend it as a way of getting to um, knowledge and cognition for participants who can't always respond and tell you the, what they know. Um, and so it's a very rich technique, but it's out of reach if those people can't come and see you in the lab or if you can't you know, ship out an expensive eye tracker many, many miles away in some cases when we see uh, participants with rare genetic syndromes, that's what happens and it's, if it's not manageable. So it makes our studies really small and not representative. So I'm so excited that at some point we might be able to do this <laughs> better. Well, I mean, it's very clear that the, the first steps are there and, and maybe we are really seeing the end of these sort of big, expensive eye tracking yeah. systems for portable, accessible kit, you know, worldwide. And I'm sensitive to the fact that the camera on like a laptop is actually relatively poor resolution, particularly relative to, you know, your phone. Yeah. Um, so the tech and the size is there. It's really, really exciting developments. Thanks so much. Uh, just want to say thanks again. Thank you.